it's certainly not harder to go from 100k to a million than it is from 10 to 100 but it always does require a change in focus hey podcast listener you're about to discover insider tips tricks and secrets to making more sales and converting more prospects into customers with email marketing for more information about the email marketing podcast or the autoresponder guy Go to dropdeadcopy.com slash podcast. Okay, it's John McIntyre here, the autoresponder guy. It's time for episode 53 of the McMethod Email Marketing Podcast, where you'll discover tactics and strategies to increase your email profits by 25 to 100% in 90 days or less without spending more on advertising. Today... I'll be talking to Perry Marshall. Now, if you've been in the online space for any amount of time, you're going to know who Perry Marshall is. He is the bona fide expert in Google AdWords. He has a best-selling book on it. He's also a uh, author of a book on Facebook advertising. But uh, the reason I got him on the show today was to talk about another book of his called 8020 Sales and Marketing, which absolutely changed the way I think about business, marketing, sales, even my to-do list. Okay, and since reading this book, I'm working less, but I'm making more money. It's the coolest thing in the world. It's the ultimate goal of the business owner, from what I understand, is to work less but make more money, right? It's all about leverage, and that's what this book's about, and that's why I got Perry Marshall on the show, and that's what we talk about today. So it's not specifically about email marketing. However, the ideas we talk about in this podcast, you can apply to email marketing, you can apply to your traffic campaigns, you can apply to everything. It's going to produce some incredible results over time. You're going to have to listen to the interview to really understand what I'm talking about, but tune out. Stay tuned in and you're going to love it. Okay, to get the show notes for this episode of the Email Marketing Podcast, go to themcmethod.com slash 53. Now, I've got no five-star reviews to read out. I thought I'd keep it quick, but if you want to make my day, if you want to spread the word and be an evangelist for the McMethod Email Marketing Podcast, go to iTunes and search for it, the McMethod Email Marketing Podcast. Leave me a review. Tell me what you think. If there are any guests you'd like me to interview, put them in there. And you put a huge smile on my face when that uh, review goes live and I will read it out on the show. Now, instead of listener questions, I thought what I'd talk about today real quick before we get into this interview is McMasters. Now, I haven't mentioned McMasters on the podcast. So first, I'll give you a quick little rundown of what it is and then I'll tell you two things that are going on in there right now that you might want to check out. McMasters is my new community. Basically, it's a private community where you can find the McIntyre Method, which is a four-week program for how to write autoresponders and a bunch of other products. Include, you know, There's a video course on how to write stories that sell, how to write pages that convert is another one exclusive interviews. There's a bunch of stuff. Anyway, I'm not going to go into all that right now. You can go check it out at themcmethod.com slash McMasters. But basically, the way to think about it is it's a private community where you can find all the products that I've created up until now and any products I'll create in the future. Okay? So, two things I want to mention and then we'll get into this interview with Perry Marshall. Number one is uh, one of the things that members get in there, I'm doing like a private podcast bit of an exclusive interview each month, which I'm playing around with. Now, the first one I did with Andre Chaperone of Autoresponder Madison and Ben Settle on the same call, which was lots of fun and very interesting. I've never done that before. It was a bit of a three-way kind of call. The whole thing's recorded. And we talked about one of the most interesting parts was Andre's soap opera sequence strategy versus Ben Settle's daily email strategy, which is a much more aggressive strategy. So we talked about that. And uh, that's one of the things you can find in McMaster's. And the other thing I wanted to mention is just a cool thread that I set up the other day that really made me laugh. And uh, it's making some of the other members crack up as well. Based on Michael Silk, a podcast episode that went live about 10 episodes ago, so almost three months ago, with Michael Silk on how to write fun emails. So the idea was that you'd go to, say, the Huffington Post, go to the weird news section and come up with and use that to come up with some ideas for emails. Now, here are some examples that I came up with. How to laugh at a robber with a meat cleaver, right? That's a subject line. Another one was why I hate bathtub tax. Another one was, is your penis fit for a museum, Right? Now, you can't send these emails every single day because they will, they're not going to work if you do it all the time. However, you can have a lot of fun with them. Let's say if I sent you an email with, is your penis fit for a museum? How could you not open that? You'd have to open it, right? And then basically what I could do is just tell the story from Huffington Post and then I would uh, transition into a pitch. It's very easy to do and that's the sort of thing you're going to learn inside McMaster. So that's in a thread called Weird Emails That Eliminate Writer's Block. And the reason <laughs> they eliminate writer's block is that you don't need to, I mean, you just go to the Huffington Post. You can go to any sort of news site and find this weird email section and use that as your inspiration. Okay, so I just wanted to mention those two things that have been happening this week at Rockin' My World. But that's it for that. Let's get into this interview with Mr. Perry Marshall. 
It's John McIntyre here, the autoresponder guy. I'm here with Perry Marshall. Now, Perry is the world's top expert on online marketing, especially pay-per-click marketing with Google AdWords, with Facebook. And I mean, we're just chatting. He does a whole range of stuff from the paid traffic to the email marketing. He's got email copywriting products. He's got stuff on the strategy and the 80-20 principle, a whole bunch of different things. Several books on AdWords, on Facebook ads, on uh, split testing, all these different stuff. So it's really, really good. I just actually read one of his books, 80-20 Sales and Marketing. I read it a couple of months ago and I've recommended it to I don't know how many friends because I, I seriously reckon it was one of the best books I've read probably in the last year about that. And I remember thinking while I was reading it that the ideas in this book are going to make me a millionaire one day. Felt a bit like escaping the matrix. You know, you'll see why in just a minute. So that's that. But first, I want to uh, welcome Perry. Perry, how are you going today? Hi, I'm great. It's a beautiful day and I'm glad to be talking to you and uh, nice to meet a guy who knows the power of autoresponders. It's <laughs> it's a little bit of a best kept secret still. So it is, I'm it is. glad that we're talking. Cool, man. Cool. I'm actually Thank blown you. away by how many, like outside the internet marketing space, a lot of people have no idea, business owners have no idea what, it, what an autoresponder even is. Yeah, you have to be an internet marketer to really know, and I think a lot of us do, but yeah, 90% of people out there, you know, some of them may have heard of it, and it doesn't mean a thing to them. So, yep, there, there's a lot of ignorance yet to stamp out. Before we get into, uh, tell uh, the listener a bit about who you are. I've given you a quick little intro, but maybe you can give them a bit more on who you are, what you do, all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm a guy who got laid off from my engineering job when my wife was three months pregnant with our first kid. And well, I ended up in sales. Like I couldn't find the engineering job I was looking for without moving away. And I didn't want to do that. Well, I'll do sales. Uh, you know, those guys aren't very smart. I think I'll like, you know, I'll whoop up on them. I'll show them. And, you know, and two years later, after a lot of bologna sandwiches and ramen soup and overdraft notices and, and all that stuff, I was like, man, you know, this is a lot harder than I thought. And it was even hard if you had a really nice boss and you worked in a good environment. It was still brutal. You know, it's like, get up every day and open the manufacturer's directory and start pounding the phone and get some appointments. And, you know, it was brutal. So I got fired from my first sales job after trying really, really, really hard for two years. But around that time, I discovered direct marketing. I heard Dan Kennedy at a seminar that I went to and he was talking about direct response advertising, which, you know, today is pretty common. It was very definitely the redheaded stepchild of advertising back then. And I found that direct marketers are kind of like engineers and like I could understand what they were saying. When somebody finally started explaining direct marketing, what actually started to make sense to me was direct mail. And now the internet was pretty new at that time uh, and I was beginning to use it, but it was like, well, you know, a sales letter needs to have this sort of a structure to it. You've got to grab the person's attention. You've got to draw them in with a story that talks about their pain. And eventually you're going to get around to explaining how your problem solves it. I'm like, okay, you know, that's something I hadn't really understood. I would go into a sales situation and I would just start showing people stuff and saying stuff and asking questions and just kind of riffing, okay? And while my riffing just didn't work very well, there's just so many things I didn't understand. All of a sudden, it started to click in place. So I took this other job and we had a website and we sold to people who used the internet and it all started to click. And after a few years of that, it was a reasonably successful sales career at that point. And I said to myself, wow, what if I actually got good at this stuff? Because right now I'm just like, I'm functional with it, okay? I'm functional and that's great. But what if I got like really good? You know, how much would that pay off? And so, well, that kind of leads to where I am now. And, you know, I got a touch of attention deficit disorder. So that's probably why I got my fingers in so many pies. And, you know, you're a copywriter and copywriter, good copywriters, I find, like, like I barely know you, okay? You know, you, you contacted my office and, and you passed the smell test and my, my staff checked you out and I checked you out. And you, you know, it looks good. Okay, you're the autoresponder guy. But I can probably make some pretty accurate predictions about you. You're a guy who 
I am going to guess is endlessly fascinated with about 900 different things. <laughs> and, the, and the only way that you can like not go stir crazy is to have another new project you can sink your teeth into every day that takes you into some other, you know, hitherto unexplored corner of the universe, right? Yeah. <laughs> if, if that if that sounds like something you'd like, well, maybe you should be a freelance marketer. <laughs> fair enough, John? Is that good? Fair enough, man. Fair enough. That's the, the endless struggle. <laughs> your family, your school teachers didn't know what to do with you. And like, what is the matter with this kid? Why won't he sit still? You know, like, why does he fidget all the time? And, you know, if he would only apply, he has so much potential. If he would only apply himself to his schoolwork, you know, instead of chasing caterpillars with magnifying glasses. <laughs> it's funny. Like, I remember for a long time. <laughs> I looked at the, you know these kind of things of like darting off in a million different directions at once as though it was a bad thing. And as I've met more entrepreneurs and more marketers, I've seen that that's, that's like a prerequisite personality function to be successful <laughs> at business. If you don't have that, it's really hard to be successful. Yeah. Yeah, it is. In fact, somebody was – I was on the phone yesterday with one of my you know close marketing friends and he goes, I am – and he's like hunting for the word. He goes, oh – Oh, I'm, he goes, I'm slightly autistic. <laughs> he goes, and I, I read this book and it said, you know, I'm constantly checking things, like checking this, checking that, checking the other thing. Well, that's actually a form of autism. It seems to be like really healthy for me. Like it works. And, you know, I've got these clients and I got to watch their stats and make sure their websites are working right. And like, well, you know, I guess I kind of like it. I'm like, well, all right. So we all, we all get our diagnosis and we harness our dysfunction. Yep. And you know, frankly, whatever dysfunction you have, even if it's like borderline personality disorder, you can find a, a way, some kind of career that's going to put it to good use. So flow with it. That's the interesting part. I reckon they call them personality disorders. Like I wonder why. I think sometimes they're only disorders because they don't fit into most people's idea of the way you know we should all live. But if you can find well, the right way I to think apply the people that. that the people that invent the labels are just trying to displace the attention away from their own disorder onto somebody <laughs> that's what's really going on so well technically i mean we're if all, we had if we were all the same in terms of business and everyone was an entrepreneur then all those weird people people would have disorders because they only wanted to focus on one thing instead of a million things well really in all seriousness you know the most important thing in marketing is having a USP, a unique selling proposition. I mean, it even took me a year or two to figure that out. And I didn't really figure it out until the direct marketers taught it to me. Okay. But eccentric people come up with USPs a lot easier than normal ones do. You know, And so if you were always eccentric and you considered it a curse, well, here it's a blessing. Absolutely. I mean, that is a great place to seg, right, into this idea of 80-20 sales and marketing because – Basically, you've got a million things. We all want to go in a million directions at once in our business. But the whole principle of this book, 80-20, the reason why I found it so valuable is I read the 4-Hour Workweek maybe three, four, what was it, five years ago, something like that. And he meant, Tim uh -huh. Ferriss mentions the 80-20 principle in that book. I was like, oh, yes. oh, that sounds kind of cool. It's a little bit helpful. But I thought I want 100% of the results. And the way he seemed to put it is I'd have to do 20%. I could do 20% of the effort and only get 80%. But I wanted to get 100%. What happened with your book? is that it kind of made this idea click that, hang on, why can't I just scale back, just do 20% to get 80%, and then not only that, double the amount of investment I put in that 20%, which then makes my output 160%. And then when that clicked, it's like, oh, hang on, out of all those million things that I could be doing, all I have to do is identify the 20%, those small things, and just double, triple, or whatever, my investment of time and energy and focus into those areas, there'll be exponential improvements over time in the business. Well, yes, that's exactly right. And the, the thing that people don't understand about 80-20 is that when you, when you find a way to get the, you know, the insignificant 80% taken care of, like sometimes it does have to be taken care of. There's some things you can't ignore. There could be 78 things that make your website work, and any one of them could make it fail, right? You know, so you have to have all 78. And there is a sense where, you know, there does have to be a 100%. But if you can get the 80 taken care of and focus on the 20 and make space, you will always find that there's another there's another place you can go where your time is even more valuable. 
in the book, it's called the 80-20 curve, and, and you know, you can graph 80-20, and it, it looks like this, kind of like this exponential growth curve, except it's more than that. It's more than exponential. It's it's really mind-bending when you get down into it, but, you know, when, when you climb that curve, you find there's always territory ahead of you that you're still not doing. And so you just kind of have to trust the process and understand that pretty much as a law of physics that those higher realms are always there. There might be occasional exceptions, but for the most part, it's true. And so what you come to understand is that the results that people get, the incomes that people make, the sales they create, all of that stuff is not in you know additions and increments it's in multiples and powers of 10 it's not you know 50 fifty thousand dollars a year sixty thousand dollars a year 70 100 110 120 no it's more like ten thousand hundred thousand million ten million mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like this uh, the way you framed it up there and what was kind of running through my head when I read the book was that it was a great metaphor for entrepreneurship, whereas when you're getting started, you start off and you're trying to make $1,000 a month. But while you're trying to make 1000 you've still got this idea in your head that it's going to take, once you get to 1000 it's going to take the same amount of time to get to 2000 And it's really hard to shake that feeling or that idea in your head. But once you get to 1000 all of a sudden, you get to three or four with quite a lot yes. faster and a lot easier than it was to get to 1000 And then you take that three and four and you get to, say, 10 or 20 And then so... It seems like entrepreneurship is there's this definition. It's on Wikipedia from some, I can't remember, some French guy. I hope that's not, not a bad that I don't even know this guy's name. <laughs> he might be real famous. But the idea is that you're moving resources from a lower area of yield to a higher area of yield. So what we're doing is everyone's yes. got their own like 80-20 in their own life right now. If they just execute on those tasks on that thing, they'll get result in the fastest way possible. But then as soon as they've done that, there'll be like another playing field and then another playing field and then another playing field. And every time they mm-hmm. run that script, they run that. It's almost like a, a script on a, on a computer. Every time you run that 80-20 script, you get bigger and bigger and bigger results. Yes. And in fact, I've said for years, it is easier to get from from $100,000 a year to a million than it is to get from 10000 to a hundred. For most people, the real barrier is getting from 10000 a year to 100000 or, you know, or in monthly sales, you know, 1000 bucks a month to 10000 a month. That's where the, the competition is really thick. And then you get a breakthrough it's certainly not harder to go from 100K to a million than it is from 10 to 100. And people don't understand that. But it always, it always does require a change in focus. You know, what the exact thing that got you to 100K a year is not going to get you to a million. You're going to be doing very different things. Right. So it's kind of like the level of thinking that got you to where you are today is different that's right. from the sort of thinking that's going to get you to where you want to be. Right. So what's the right. – go on. No, go ahead. Because a lot of business owners have heard this. I mean I heard it in the 4-Hour Work Week five years ago. It took another five years for it to really click. So it wasn't sort of seeing that like I understood it but I didn't do anything about it or really think about it with any sort of proper, I guess, focus. Whereas it, you know, this year, since I've read the book, every day when I wake up, it's becoming more of a habit now. But I'm thinking, what can I eliminate from this list that just isn't really going to matter much at all? And it turns out there's a lot of stuff that I've been doing that I don't really need to do. Or I can just hire, you know, I've hired one person, hiring another person next week. And it's all because of starting to think like this. So what's, I mean, what have you seen in your work with business owners that like some of the biggest barriers that stop people from thinking like this and how, how to overcome them? The way that I overcame it was starting to see all the things on my list to do every day as being on an exponential scale. So there's $10 an hour tasks and there's $100 an hour tasks and there's $1,000 an hour tasks and $10,000 an hour tasks. In fact, I have a chart on page 119 that that describes, you know, typical, you know, there's a $10 column and a $100 column and a $1,000 an hour column. And it tells you what those things typically are and what you typically earn from those efforts. And, and so like if you, okay, let's say that you have a to-do list with 111 things, which, you know, for a week there might be 111. Well, 100 of those things are worth 10 bucks an hour and 10 of them are worth 100 bucks an hour and one is worth 1,000 bucks an hour. That's kind of how it is. And so, like, if you know that, if you know that one-tenth of your tasks are 10 times as valuable, if you know that 1% of your tasks are 100 times as valuable, 
all of a sudden it just completely shifts your understanding of what's important and what's not. And what I find is a lot of people are, everybody who's really good at anything is a perfectionist in, in some sense. But most of us misapply our perfectionism. And we sit and we polish these little turds, and, <laughs> and it, it doesn't actually make any difference whether most of these things are done really well or, frankly, done sort of lousy, as long as they get done somehow by somebody. Whereas if, if you focus your perfectionism on, you know, a few things, you know, you think about it, there's like, think of bands and songs and, and stuff like that, you know, a band in their entire career. They'll probably have five or ten hits. What that means is there's only five or ten songs that absolutely had to be perfect. You know, yep. you have an album and you get one or two hits and the other songs are definitely not hits. Well, those other songs, it, sure, it's good for the fans and the people that buy the album for those songs to be done well. But it's really the hit songs that need to be perfect. Now, what I found is... You can't predict the hit song before you even record them. Uh, maybe you can, but usually you can't. You have to get things to some level of acceptability before you can tell which one's going to take off. But I, I bet you by the time they at least had the basic tracks laid down, most of the bands had a pretty good idea which two or three songs were going to you know, be popular and which ones weren't. Right. And so you have to be very selective about your perfectionism and then also understand that there are some things, there's a tiny, just few things that almost couldn't be perfect enough. It's like hmm. you, you could just continue to make them more and more perfect and you will continue to make exponentially more results from them. What's an example of something like that? Well, I think a, a big one is, is how products get simplified. I think the highest form of perfection in perfectionism is the kind of perfectionism that Steve Jobs applied. Okay. So Steve Jobs, he wanted products to be, they, they needed to be functional and they needed to, to do the things that they're supposed to do, but they also needed to do it with utmost simplicity and ease. And so I think a lot of us do is, you know, we get into business and we finally eventually figure out how to make it work. But then what we try to do, we try to become more successful by making what we sell more complicated. And I think, you know, that's okay and it's kind of normal, but the real breakthroughs are when you figure out how to simplify something to a tremendous degree. Okay, so like, the smartphone is a tremendous simplifier because, oh, you need a guitar tuner, download an app. You need a metronome, download an app. You need a map, download an app. And it all fits in your pocket. And the phone only has two buttons, right? It's right. got that little round one in the bottom and it's got the power button at the top. Okay, that is extreme simplicity extreme simplicity. And so I think what everybody needs to be doing. So one of my favorite phrases in marketing is sell results, not procedures. Okay. And I stole it from Herschel Gordon Lewis. Now, if you apply sell results, not procedures to everything you sell, it changes the definition of what you sell. Okay. So Coffee. Coffee shops thought they were selling coffee. Starbucks, hmm. 20 years ago, whenever they kind of, you know, caught their stride, they said, we're going to sell a $2 luxury and a luxury experience that everybody can afford. And they made a Starbucks store into a little taste of luxury. Okay, now I like Starbucks. I like going there. I went there yesterday. Why do I like it? Well, you know, I like the music. I like the atmosphere. I like the coffee. I like the caffeine buzz. And I like the fact that I can go sit there with my notebook or my laptop and I can do some work. And it's a very pleasant thing. Mm -hmm. Think how different that is from going to McDonald's where for the same amount of money I get a meal 
I think, I mean, McDonald's is remarkable too. Their food's not healthy and, and I don't really like it, but it's remarkable that you can go and for four bucks, you know, you can get a lunch and it, you know, the kids think it tastes great. That's for <laughs> sure. But Starbucks is is selling you a hamburger in uh, sorry, McDonald's selling a hamburger. Starbucks is selling you an experience. They are selling you a result, not a procedure. Hmm. Starbucks does not sell coffee. Okay. Okay. So I don't care what you, if you sell medical equipment or you sell, if you can say what is the end result that the person actually wants, nobody who bought a drill wanted a drill, they wanted a hole. If you say I am in the hole making business instead of I'm in the drill business, that will always lead you to solve problems better and more simply than everybody else is. And there's no end to how much you can do this right. because there's no end to problems in the world. You can do it and do it and do it. So, you know, the 80-20 curve, it goes up and up and up and it never stops. It just goes higher and higher. For me, what the 80-20 curve is, it's a rational reason to, be, to have faith that there's always another opportunity, that there's always a higher ladder that you can climb, mm. okay? And I think all entrepreneurs, all business owners also need to know there's no end to the problems that they can solve. The well of human desires is bottomless. How high is up? It doesn't stop. Right. There is no limit. You know, compared to 200 years ago, everybody on the planet just about is wealthy. Compared to now, the people 200 years from now, they will consider us to be unfortunate. <laughs> all those poor people, you know. <laughs> With iPhones and computers and all that stuff. So That's right. Just to wrap, we'll wrap it up right here, but just to summarize that, it's like saying you're not in the Facebook advertising business, you're in the make more money business. Well, yes. And, you know, everybody's in the make more money business. And if you don't have an identity, that something that people can hang their hat on and a USP, then you're still dead in the water. But regardless of what your exact, unique, individual USP is, there is still the bottom line that, Okay. You know, my customers want to make more money. Absolutely. And and I have to be in the business of that. And if I start thinking that I'm in the business of click-through rates and impressions and all these funky little techniques that I get enamored with, I'm going to stagnate. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're in the get more clients business. Yeah. I see what you mean. So you've got to have the USP. Where it's like, you know, I'm the autoresponder guy. You're the traffic guy. But then right. under that, you know, the second layer of that is, yeah, I'm this guy, but... I'm really here just to help you make more sales, but I'm going to do it under the guise of email or traffic or whatever that happens to be. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's right. Fantastic. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up right here. I know you're going to get going, but before we go, give uh, the listener a uh, heads up about where they can go to learn more about you or the book or anything you want to talk yeah, about. Yeah. So if I could just pick one thing to encourage people to go do, it would be read the 80-20 sales and marketing book and read the whole thing. I wrote this for two kinds of people. I wrote this for the guy who is just like I was 20 years ago when I got fired from my first sales job and like was scraping change out of the car seats in order to buy lunch. Okay. But I also wrote it for, you know, the guy who's running a $50 million company and literally the book it will change your perspective. And, and uh, John, you can agree or disagree, but I think it, it will actually alter your perspective about what's important in sales and marketing in a major way. It will make a major shift. And I have a very interesting offer on my website. If you go to sell8020.com, sell dot com, I've got an offer and I'll sell you my book for seven bucks. It's a penny plus six ninety nine shipping if you're in the US or it's shipping is double if you're outside the US, but less money than Amazon, less money than the bookstore, I'll ship it to you. Read the book from cover to cover. And why am I doing this? I mean, I'm taping dollar bills to this book. <laughs> but here's why I'm doing this. I found out, did the numbers and did the math, you know, 80-20, right? Well, 78.6% of the people who buy that book don't buy anything else from me. And you know what? 21.4% do. 
And they go on to be raving fans and great customers. And I'm willing to tape dollar bills to that book for the 20% who step up and go, hey, I really like that. And they're, you know, they're like John McIntyre, like, oh, I really like this book. You know, I'm going to pay attention to this guy. I think it will change your life. And so you can go to sell8020.com. You can buy it for seven bucks. You know, even if you have to scrape the seven bucks out of your car seats and skip lunch, you should buy this book because it will change your life. Cool. All right, I'll have a link to that in the show notes at <laughs> McMethod.com. I can highly recommend the book. It does produce a huge change, a huge shift in your thinking, so no arguments there at all. Perry, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, John. It was great to talk to you today. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you want to discover more insider tips, tricks, and secrets about driving sales with email marketing, sign up for daily email tips from the autoresponder guy. Go to dropdeadcopy.com slash podcast, sign up, confirm your email address, and I'll send you daily emails on how to improve your email marketing and make more sales via email. You'll find out why open rates don't matter and the seven-letter word that underlies all effective marketing and much more.